I yeah, will. Bold way. I will talk to Andy and see what I did wrong. I probably there's a toggle or something there. I thought didn't you get the uploads last week? That, yeah. 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 Last, week. last week. Yeah. So maybe it's Andy sabotaging you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you hey, got a point. That, that's, everything's being recorded got now. Be careful what you say. <laughs> yeah, right. I said it, Andy. Brad Booker said it. Joe <laughs> <laughs> <Jill> Kinzer agreed. <laughs> Wow. That's just got serious. <laughs> okay. Oh, Let's Lord. Let's deal with <laughs> the change in pressure. Beginning here, leading men and movements of the period. Now, what I want to do tonight is take us into now the theological beginning of the church. And we're going to pull our way through this till we get into the ancient period, and then we're going to deal with the masses. Now, unfortunately, um, Maybe what I need to do is go back and reconsider how I've got this formatted for future generations. But for you folks, it'll be kind of a back and forth. So, next, this coming week, in your assignment, you're going to be looking at some of the doctrinal issues that I've uploaded a ton of stuff for you to take a look at. We'll try to get through some of that. We're a little, we're running an hour late now. So we're going to try to get through that for you at least cover the major points, and if we don't get a horrendous snow by, you know, 9.30 or before 9.30, we'll, we'll, we'll try to have it done. And if it starts snowing, we'll kind of gauge it, and if we have to let you go early, we will. But, um, so let's, let's just kind of start looking at this piece. Now let me, let me before I, I got to take another uh, diversion moment here. Um, the way the syllabus is set up, the fourth week, which the week after next, or after this week coming, covers an enormous amount of material. It's the entire Middle Ages, starting with about 500 all the way up to 1500. Mm -hmm. that, that's a thousand years in one week. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no way you can comprehend <laughs> all of that. And you have so many major things going on during that time. You have the development of the papacy, you have the <clears throat> crusades going on during that time. You have some very major personalities that are out there uh, developing. So, for your paper for the Middle Ages, I would say, you know, throw a dart at it and you'll pick somebody and just go with them. Um, and uh, there are a lot of good people that you can look at. Uh, I am not going to get into, I'm going to, on purpose, do a little change here in the syllabus for that fourth week. Right now it's set up where it's, we're supposed to take in the pre-Reformation individuals, people calling for reform, like Whitcliffe and, uh, and um, <clears throat> others, uh, John Huss and others. I'm going to postpone them and throw them in with the Reformation period. So you start looking at Huss, which is like 1300, and Whitcliffe, who was in the 1300s. And you'll look at them as kind of precursors getting into the Reformation movement. Um, I have to tell you a little story. When I first started teaching church history about 20-some years ago uh, for Ashland, um, we had 10 weeks to uh, teach the first segment, which was you know, from last week through to just before the Reformation, through humanism up into this period of the scholasticism and such. Then we had 10 more weeks to teach from the Reformation through the American period. So now, <laughs> you're getting the joy of getting 2,000 years crammed, not into 20 weeks, but into seven. And believe me, it, if you think it's frustrating for you, you ought to be a professor to figure out what do you pick out to, you know, to say, all right, look at this and forget everything there's else a, in between. There's so. a YouTube video, it's called something like 2,000 years of church history crammed in five minutes. I learned nothing from it. <laughs> no, you would, you would yeah. learn absolutely nothing from that. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> I could say that for sure yeah. just listening to it. It's hard enough. I mean, and, and you're going to, you know, you're going to pick things up. And what I'm hoping is that we can, with the topics that I give you to discuss, and the idea behind your discussion board is to try to work these ideas out within there, and then to summarize your ideas. I find 
that adult students do a lot better uh, when, they, when they write papers and have to think about what they've talked about, what they've been reading, and condense it down. Because you just can't pick and choose and, you know, and cut and paste and throw in there because it's, you're condensing what you've thought about, what you've talked about, what you've read, and you've got to condense it down into kind of your pithy statements so that you show some comprehension, some understanding of the dialogue that is going on within your group forum, and, and put it out there. And I think that's much better in the long run as a learning tool than just trying to memorize facts, take a test, and move on the next week. You forgot what you studied then. You know? I think there's a little more learning that goes on in posting papers. So that's why I've taken the liberty to, to change from quizzes to, to doing that summary paper. That's method of the madness, so to speak, for that. So that's why I'm doing that. Um, so uh, this week, um, carry on your conversations. I went in, I was reading your post, and I, I thought you were heading down the right trail in that. Um, the summary paper, I've got to get a your time factor in there. So I'll put it up for you to post this week so you can get it all up this week. And then I'll have the other one up and going. Um, any questions about any of those? Simon, it sounds like a lot. It is a lot that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the reading logs, any question about those? Just in the summer, the the summary statement that and you're asking. That, you little, look, it, it's just reflection. It's more reflection. Ideas, maybe a question that came up in the process of your reading. Okay. Something you want to put in there that will stimulate you later. If you ever look at this, you know, in 10 years, okay. because I think right. you want to read this. Yeah. All right. I was just trying to figure out how on earth do I summarize. No, you don't. No, 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 no you're not about Or do it into, into a sentence Especially or two. Especially the so. thousand years that we're going to be doing. Yeah, thousand years we're going to be doing. It's the idea is just here. here's an idea. Just that something that struck yeah. me. Okay. Yeah, All something right. Struck All right. Me. That I can do. Or something you'd like to research later. Okay. You know, something kind of touches you and you say, you know, I want to find out more about that. For example, maybe in one of the reform movements you'd look at the Cluny monasteries. I'd like to research that further and, 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 and see what was really up there. Or maybe I'd like to study feudalism a little further if you hadn't studied the Western Civ or you'd forgotten all about it, how that applied to the church. Uh, you know, it, you just write a comment in there. That's all I'm looking for. That shows okay. that you're doing some thinking. Do not do this. I had one woman do this one time, and she wrote, boring, 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 you know. <laughs> not a way to get a grade, you know. <laughs> you have a teacher make us read this. Is <laughs> we'll be putting that. <laughs> so uh, that's not the way to do it. But, uh, yeah, and then on the summaries, I've kind of explained that uh, in the dialogues. And then your, your, uh, your outline uh, for the person. Yeah. Um, Back to the reading log, when we read all of these extra readings that you have, do you want us to put that on the reading log? Put also? it on your reading log. It, it's not something that, I mean, if you want to make comments, I'm, I'm a, the comment piece is for you to just... As it comes to you. As it comes to you. Okay. The, every reading doesn't have to have a comment. Yes, how are you? Okay. okay. It's Andy. Sorry. That's the only reason I answered it. Um, no, we haven't. In fact, we gave up. Um, we, we, we went. I'm, I'm recording the I'm recording um, Professor um, Emptage's uh, and, and we'll post that later. Um, but that's best we can do at the moment. No, it has something to do with um, polycom or, or whatever the condyl. The, it has something to do with, with their side. And apparently there's nothing. We can't get them to, to get it fixed apparently right now. So. Okay, no problem. All right, thanks. Bye. Okay, sorry. I just saw that it was <laughs> no, no, right. 740 number and figured it was Andy. So. Yeah, Buffy, you were saying. <laughs> Oh, no, I just, that answers it. If we, I just was wondering if you wanted all that on the reading log, too. I see. Okay. Yes. And then the other has to do with the, um, with your biographical sketch. Um, so long as they're within the readings for that week, that's all, that's all you have to worry about. So if you're selecting somebody. Okay. 
fitted into there. I had a, I had a quick question as sure. you were talking. Um, I pulled out Raymond Lull from the Turning Points book, mm -hmm. but then as you were talking, I realized that he was probably more of a middle medieval middle middle ages guy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Um, so I already. That's the one that I've got. We'll save for later. Okay. Do you want me to go back then and do a patristic and? Yeah, do a patristic. Do something okay. like Irenaeus. Or, okay. Or Athanasius All right. I'll or, go back and do origin. that. And hold on to him. Origin's a good one to study. I, I just, if you haven't done it yet, let me just throw his name out there. Okay. He was quite a contributor to, uh, you know, to early theology. Irenaeus is another one that was very good uh, to look at. He he writes early on. He was. Uh, he was killed, he, he ministered in Lyon, uh, in what is today France, then it was Gaul, and uh, was smartered up in that area, but he wrote uh, one of the first books against history, one of the first letters or treatises against heresies, I should say. And um, his ideas and some of his basic theology was early on working within the context of the church. So, you know, it's interesting how the influences come very early on and how we've kept with some of that tradition. Uh, that, that's really part and parcel of who we are. Deep, deep traditions here. Okay. Any questions about, any other questions or questions about the biographical sketch? The only thing I was thinking, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting up all the reading done by Friday to post, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. especially this week, yeah. if we post on Saturday. Or we or I can move the post back. If that helps, does that help you guys? Or I know I'm having. Well, I, I think you can just leave the the post, and we just get on when we can. I'm just, I'm I'm with you. I I didn't get I, I didn't get the reading done until late Saturday night. Yeah. And I can move the post date. I didn't back. post till That's Sunday night. Problem. So. Um, I you know I'm just trying to think of ways so we can encourage um, dialogue to get it up early enough so that someone has a chance to look and respond to you. Right. So if we make it Saturday, that gives you an extra day, but then, you know, you've got Monday and Sunday and Saturday and then you want to be posted. I'm leaving like the post day is today, so you have to 11 o'clock tonight. I'll, I mean, I'm changing that because you can't get in. So, but, but in our, our normal cycle it would be like tonight would be the due date for the post, your final summary post for the week. So, so it's always going to be due the week, the night of class, eleven o'clock. So when you go home, if you have, you want to put some final touches on it that came out of the lecture or whatever you could. So, and I'm I'm willing to work in here because I realize this is not a perfect world in which we're working with, obviously. <laughs> I'm trying to adjust to a different rhythm because I'm teaching three different classes right now. <laughs> and so if I'm trying to keep, and I'm retired too. And, um, so I'm trying to keep my rhythm uh, you know, right. And, and I'm certainly willing to, to work with you folks and, and so that, you know, that, I, that I can kind of fall into the rhythm that you folks are already used to. Be this is my first time, not from, I talked about Alberta back in the main campus back in the 80s for about, I don't know, probably five years total. And so this is my first time back here at the campus. And I've taught adult learning style evening classes. That's been my gig for 20 plus years. So <laughs> this is nothing new in that regard. Okay, enough of that. All right, let's, let's talk about the leading <coughs> um, when we're looking at the ancient period, and by that, uh, we're talking, is this what I operate this No, you're, the, the other, it's a, this one? Nope, it's a round, it's got a round top on it. Oh, that's right. little black one. thing with there it, yep, there, there you go. There we go, got it, thanks. When we're looking at the ancient period and uh, what revolves around it, one of the things that we need to kind of try to understand a little bit is how we begin to evolve and what's going on, what's the primary things that uh, are of, of importance early on in the development of the church. Now, 
Certainly, we recognize a couple things, and we've talked about it, and then they come up here, but let me say it right off the front. Very early church is Jewish. It's still Jewish. And when you're thinking about it, it is not until we reach the end of the patristic period, or in the period that we're going to talk about here in a little bit, or apostolic period, uh, that we really switch from a Jewish-led church to a Gentile church. And the transition's going on. And I think you can safely say that after 70 AD, when Titus destroyed Jerusalem, that was the end of the Jewish era of the Christian church. Because they, they literally, you know, took their hobnail boots and stomped on that church and on the city, and the Christians were fleeing away from there. One tradition says they went to Petra, others probably didn't go to Petra. But um, nevertheless, that's one tradition. But they certainly splintered in many different directions. And that could very well be called not only the Jewish diaspora, but the Christian diaspora. Mm -hmm. And it changed the, the, the face of the church forever at that particular point. Right. So what are some of the problems that we have in the very early church? Well, three major things confront the early church. The first thing is persecution. We've got that recorded in the book of Acts, Stephen, right away. Mm -hmm. Paul goes through all kinds of persecutions, and he gives his own testimony as to what he was facing. But persecutions very early on, and as we get to, when we get to 64, if you didn't remember in your readings, I'll remind you that Nero had a heyday with the Christians. Mm -hmm. Tradition is he blamed the Christians for burning Rome. Some say that he actually was one to set the fire, but no one really knows how it happened. Maybe old Erie's cow kicked over the, you know, the lantern, as in Chicago, and that's what started the whole thing. We don't know. But to divert the blame from him, according to tradition, he blamed the Christians. And there was no love lost there between either side. But nevertheless, uh, he, he had the power, and you know, he was drinking his wine out of lead cups. It was the fancy metal of the day. <laughs> also killing himself. That's why he was insane, probably. <laughs> and um, so they have the beginning of the formal persecution of the church by the Roman government in 64 AD. And uh, so early on, well, in response to the persecution, you have the rise of the apologists. Now, apologists are more of the second generation. You remember last week I talked about how the church begins to develop. You have your pioneers, your apologists, and you keep moving your way up. So we're now in our second generation. And the apologists come out in defense of the church because of the accusations that the Roman church is throwing at them. And they accuse them of many different things. You probably picked that up in your reading among the things. They talked about them being insurrectionists. They weren't loyal to the country. They wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, plot, you know, they wouldn't fight the wars. Or if they did, they wouldn't kill anybody. So what's the purpose of being there? You know, and that they ate babies and, you know, and that they had love orgies. And, you know, they just accuse them one thing after another. And so uh, they had to write to defend that. And so that's where you get persons like Irenaeus and others. Uh, who began to, uh, and Tertullian, who began to defend who we are as apologists. Did I write Hershey in there? I sure did. It's not a candy bar, it's supposed to be heresy. Is that, well, it's Hershey, isn't it? Hershey. Hershey. Anyway, it's heresy. Yeah. I'll have to correct that one. All right, so, uh, but anyway, you have heresies going on, and as a result of heresies, you then begin to the development of councils, creeds, and canons. Uh, canons is where you try to solidify what is the scripture we're going to use. Now it's interesting that uh, Christians work hard to try to formalize what their scriptures are going to be. They go through great debates. Things are kicked out. If you remember, you know, the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve, I think I have that posted for you to look at, uh, was even considered for scripture, but then it was later kicked out. Uh, there were other, like for example, the Apocalypse of Peter was considered but kicked out. Revelation almost didn't make it in, and there was some thought it was, you know, too wild and woolly and out there. They weren't sure of the authorship, whether it was really John of Patmos, if the John of Patmos was in fact John the Apostle, or if he was not. See, there's still a lot out there that we don't know. A lot of traditions, ideas that circulate around, 
his ideas have been stayed with the church in 2,000 years, but on another hand, we're not absolutely certain those traditions were correct. So there is a little give and take there that you have to understand. But standing on the ideas that were early on, and remember, some of these things weren't being cemented down and formulated. Like, for example, the canon of the New Testament wasn't cemented down and formulated officially until 397. That's 350 years after Jesus. That's longer than we've been a nation. You realize? I mean, the pilgrims landed here in 1620. So it's been more than four, almost 400 years. It's been, it was almost that long. If you can figure the pilgrims to this point, it was almost that long before we actually submitted the canon out. So imagine we got the pilgrims there, and they were trying to figure out what we should be believing, and now we're just now deciding what we should believe. You can imagine all the okay. time and, and problems we have. I can imagine them. if we're still trying to figure out the Constitution. Yeah, exactly. It'd be, it'd be like that. Yeah. Instead of, okay. well, we yeah, are. Still <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's another problem that goes on, but still, it is trying to work with that and formulate the ideas. So, creeds. What is it we really believe? And that's one of the things this week, as you do your reading, there's going to be a lot, uh, well, maybe it was even last week's reading. But anyway, you're beginning to see the struggles of who was Christ, how do we decide whether he was God or man or both, you know, and, and they get into those questions and they become a part of our theology. Pause, time out here. Are, have you had a theology course yet or are you yet to take your theology? I'm in it right now. You're in yeah. theology right now. <laughs> no, we haven't had one. Others of you will be taking it or have taken it? No, yeah, we have not taken it yet, but we will be. You will be. So you will be getting in the, into these ideas as they're kind of working themselves out, uh, but we expose you to the concepts tonight. And, and then, schisms. Everybody's got a good idea. It's kind of like, I've got a better mousetrap, you know, everybody will beat a path to your door kind of thing. And we have a lot of ideas that are out there circulating around. People wanting to think, well, you know, it's really about this. This is the way we ought to think about Jesus. Or this is the way things ought to be done. And everybody's got an idea. And we have strong personalities. And you have persecution of the church driving people over into this area, and then they're influenced by this idea. So you have a Greek idea, and then you have a Western Gaul idea, and then you have a North African idea. And you've got these multiplicity of, co of ideas coming from multiplicity of cultures. And Christianity is trying to harmonize and come together. What we come out of eventually what you and I come out of eventually is a Western tradition. There's a whole Eastern tradition, folks, that we often don't even get in and touch, and you hardly have time to even read about. Mm -hmm. But there is the Eastern Church. That's the reason we had the big split and final, final split in 1053-ish. Um, because East is East and West and West, and the two are not going to come together on ideas. And so we come out of a Western tradition that was finally formulated into what becomes known as the Catholic Church, or the Latin Church. <coughs> that will be who we are. So schisms existed. And so there's an answer to that, having leadership going on here, and the development of bishops. Now, a bishop is no more than the idea of pastor. They were pastors, overseers, taking care of the flock, like, a, like, like any pastor would do. But then there are those pastors within a particular area that seem to have a little more influence, a little more power, a little more pull, a little more persuasive in their arguments that time, kind over time float to the surface as a better leader. And early as 150 with Ignatius, there was the idea that Rome now, since we don't have a Jerusalem and Peter's dead and all those other leaders of the early church are gone, we need a head at the church, and who's going to be the head of the church? And as early as 150, the idea is starting to circulate around that we ought to have the bishop at the church in Rome because Rome is the center of the empire, and we have several churches there. We ought to have the bishop of Rome kind of giving the marching orders to the church overall. So very early on, we're starting to formulate ideas for leadership, and it doesn't happen all at once. These are evolving. I mean numbers of generations come and go and live and die 
before mm -hmm. all these ideas are really cemented down. So the things, just for example, you and I be discussing in this classroom, you'll be my age or older and you're still discussing them and haven't cemented them down yet. That's the ideas that are going on in this. So it didn't happen overnight, folks. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen overnight. So what do you have? Well, when you start looking at the way we break down church history, we start out with what is called the apostolic period. This is simply talking about the period of the apostles. This is the time where the apostles are still alive, their influence is still being felt, some of them are being killed off by martyrdom, and all twelve, according, except, well, except for John, tradition says he died on the Isle of Patmos, but literally, literally all twelve of them were persecuted or killed in one way or another, most of them martyred. And so when we think of the apostolic period, we're really dealing with those 12 apostles, throw in the, uh, uh, let's see, we threw it, uh, where is he? Uh, I don't see him on there right now. And quite frankly, the brother of Jesus, James, is an early leader of the church. That is pretty well confirmed. And Peter, a leader of the church. So you've got some strong personalities that seem to come forth there. So when we talk about the apostolic, we're talking about the direct successors of Jesus. Those who, in fact, heard the teachings of Jesus and are now the second generation underneath the leader passing on the teachings of Jesus. So the closer you can get to Jesus in terms of the teachings, the purer the teachings should be, right? Well, theoretically, yes. Now... We have a problem though. There was no written communication among these people. Most of them, there were poor people, poorly educated, not saying they weren't intelligent, just poorly educated. And they had to have a few scribes brought in to start writing things down. When we start talking about canonization and recording of scripture, and you probably will get into that into your higher criticism class or one of your Bible classes that you'll probably take, you'll start talking about when was the first scripture recorded, the ones of the New Testament that have been canonized, and we start talking about, well, maybe Paul's letter to the Corinthians was the first one around 45 AD, maybe. And then we start talking about when was the Gospels then actually written down, and we had something in, in writing with regard to the Gospel. Then we start saying, well, maybe about 50 AD, we've got the Peter's sermon being recorded by Mark, and so we have the Gospel according to Mark. Well, at least that's what tradition is saying, but the truth be, no, we are not absolutely 100% sure that it was Mark that was spoken of by Paul in, the, in Paul's letters that actually wrote the gospel. We're, that's tradition. That's all we have. We have not 100% authenticity here. We have none of the original documents that have long gone, died, you know, been buried or decayed or whatever. I mean, we don't have any of that stuff. But we have tradition. And tradition seems to be pretty strong on some of these issues. So by 100, we think the last of the books, the last of the Gospels, John's Gospel has been recorded, the, the Revelation has been recorded of those books that we have. And so in one way or another, tradition says that all the Gospels and most of the letters, if not all the letters, have been written that are part of our canon by the death of the last apostle around 100 AD. That's tradition. John could have died earlier. The John of Patmos, as I mentioned, might not have been the John of the Gospel, but tradition says he was, and we have to accept tradition. That's all we really have is tradition. And so we go on that. Seems to be a pretty strong tradition. But I won't tell you that it's absolute. We don't know. So we go with the best we have. So this early apostolic period was clearly Jewish, as I mentioned earlier, but we're having an increase in the number of Gentiles that are being converted, and so we're beginning to see congregations in various parts of the, of the empire beginning to take on more of a non-Jewish or a Gentile look. And of course, the conversion rate, as Paul had gone into the, into the uh, into the synagogues to start his conversion or his work with the gospel message to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Well, within the synagogue, there was a whole layer of people waiting to hear the gospel because they were attracted to Jewish ideas of, of, of morals and, and their teaching on monotheism, 
And these people were the non-proselyted Gentiles called the God-fearing or the God-fearers. And they were there and they became the center point of Paul's message. And those were, those were the people who were being converted and the church grew out of that group. So, apostolic period is over by 100. The last apostle dies. And then we move into what is known as the post-apostolic period, which runs from 100 till about 325. That's a round date. You know, no, no dates are absolute, <laughs> unless you can find the actual death date. But, you know, ideas kind of float. So, we don't just cut it off here and move on. We're floating. We're always floating in history on, on these kind of ideas. But nevertheless, post-apostolic, what do we mean by that? Well, here's, it's the name that has been given to the Christian church and to those writers who then began to begin to develop a doctrine before Constantine declared the church legal. So these are the fellows that have some link to the apostles in one way or another and they're writing for the church. They're writing, most of these are defenses of the church doctrine, ideas, the beginning to formulate ideas about the canon and the gospels, they're formulating ideas concerning creed and doctrine, they're beginning to formulate uh, uh, um, they're beginning to formulate um, defenses for the church. They're beginning to put together ideas about ecclesiastical direction and dictums concerning uh, the church. Decisions of church councils begin to float up during this time. And so we call these the fathers. These are the fathers that have been getting to develop and put skin on the skeleton of the church. That's what's going on now. Now, this is a, and so some of these people that we consider, by the way, this is a traditional picture of um, Peter and Paul, who were both martyred in uh, Rome. And so that's where that picture comes from. There's a traditional place on the Appian Way, a prison where uh, these, these two were supposedly held, according to tradition again. And, uh, so you find the, uh, this uh, mosaic there uh, depicting uh, their place of where they were held in prison before they were martyred. Well, back to the apostolic fathers. Uh